CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... E.G. Marshall. Many of you within the sound of my voice will be present at the birth of the 21st century. Some among us were born a little too early for that. We'll just have to sit around and guess what life in the 2000s may be like. And one person's guess is as good as another's. Except for the scientists who claim to have sort of an inside track on the future. They think, some of them, that they know where we're headed. Mike, the instruments here are going crazy. I think what we've been suspecting all along may already be happening, Doctor. I'm almost sure of it. Get into your choppers and head north immediately. Don't stop for a thing. It may be the end of the world. Our mystery drama, Bottom of the World, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Tony Roberts and Christopher Tabori. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It's a peaceful spring morning. The year is sometime in some century of the future. Three men are seated in a glass fishing boat. The high-powered motor is speeding them to the middle of a huge freshwater lake. At this moment, they are some three miles from the nearest shoreline. The oldest of the three men smiles at his two younger passengers, nods, and gears the motor down to a slow idle. Bob? J.J., I think this is it. How can you tell, Dr. Burns? I've been here before. Yes, this uh, this should be an ideal spot. So this is where the fish are, Doctor. Fish? <laughs> of course. They've never failed me. Not once, J.J. And I'm sure they'll cooperate today. Shall I cut the motor, Doctor? No, Bob. Uh, keep it at idle. It's, uh, it's safer. Dr. Burns. Yes, Bob? I speak for J.J. as well as for myself. You mustn't think we don't appreciate a man on a schedule as murderous as yours, head of one of the most sensitive agencies in the whole government, closing up shop for a whole morning just to take two of his younger protégés off on a fishing trip. So we've been wondering, well, how shall I say it, what you've done to deserve such special treatment. Something like that. Yeah. Why us? Well, first get your lines over the side, Bob. Let's see. You've been with the command uh, how long? Three and a half years? Nearly four. And uh, and you, J.J.? Nearly 15 months now. The Strategic Sea Command, the SSC, thinks you're both just about tops. Thank you. (laughs) And that's why I brought you out here today to the middle of this lake. To talk. (laughs) Only incidentally to fish. Is it safe? Well, the boat's been gone over from stem to stern clean, no listening devices. We'll keep the motor idling. So uh, what we say will be for our ears only. Now listen, both of you. To begin, you both know what our energy situation is. Of course. The last drop of oil was drained out of the entire planet way back in the year uh, 1998, wasn't it? Fissionable material for any nuclear energy is almost gone. Fossil fuels exhausted. Wind and tidal energy is neither dependable nor sufficient. And our last hope, uh, energy from the sun, hasn't worked out the way we'd hoped. Not quite. You know that back in the 1970s, we started to investigate the possibilities of oil in the south polar area of the sub-frigid zone. But we failed. It was impossible to reach whatever may have been there if there was anything to begin with. That's true. After all these years... We're trying again. We are. Two weeks ago, we started drilling. We're drilling at this very moment. For what could be billions of barrels of oil. 
Our technology has improved to where we think we may have an even chance of success. In the South Polar area? Why are you telling this to us? What's that noise? Uh, where do you come in? By the, uh, by the front door, like everyone else. After all, it uh, is a private restaurant. I'm told they have a new chef. Y- yes, who specializes in preparing seafood. Yes, exactly. A little expensive, but it's uh, it's worth every cent. <laughs> I uh, eat every chance I... I think whoever was in that plane has gone, so we can continue. Now, to answer your question, where do you come in? The SSC is sending you both down there to report on whatever progress we may be making. Yes, but surely your technical crew keeps you informed. We're in constant radio contact with them. Mike Gonzalez is one of the best in the whole command. Not only an engineer, but a bit of a poet, too. Then, excuse me for asking, Doctor, but they... They are very much aware of what we're up to. Their noses are out of joint because of it. And they will stop at nothing, absolutely nothing, to prevent us. That and something much more serious. Which is? The sub-frigid ice sheet, as you well know, covers over five million square miles. How thick it is, how deep down it goes, is anybody's guess. Anything that would cause that huge continent, that solid block of blue ice, to slip, to break up, to disintegrate, would mean the end of all of us. Wouldn't it? But all the way it probably happened 20,000 years ago. The last ice age. Any slippage of the ice sheet, any breaking of this tremendous mass of mild, thick ice would result in gigantic tidal waves all over the globe, which would cause sea levels to be raised to what? 40, 50 feet? We estimate hundreds of feet, maybe even thousands. What would happen to our cities? I suppose most of them would wind up at the bottom of the sea. And it's only the beginning. As these gigantic blocks of ice keep rushing to the north, melting almost not at all, their white, snowy surface would reflect solar energy back into space. And the entire atmosphere around us would be chilled way down below the freezing point. Way, way down below. Yes, but Dr. Burns, why would... Why would they consider doing anything like that? I mean, even if they could make it happen, they'd be out of their minds. They would consider it, Bob. And they could make it happen. There's not enough space on this globe for both them and us. Yes, but wouldn't that be the end of the world for them, too? Not by a long shot, Bob. Unfortunately for us. Your job, my friends, is to prevent this if you can. When do we leave, Dr. Burns? Tomorrow morning. Uh, Meantime, J.J., you have a nibble at the end of your line. (laughs) Pull it in. Slowly. Slowly. Oh, it's a big one. Hold on to it, J.J. (laughs) Careful. Here it comes. Uh, Look at the size of it. Oh, what a beauty. Wait a minute. Don't don't touch it. All right, what is it? Fastened onto its side. Look. A tiny microphone. Like this air down here, JJ? Never, Bob. It's the first time in my life I'm able to see the air I'm breathing. It actually glitters. It's the uh, ice crystals falling through the air. I remember reading about it. Clear air precipitation, it's called. Well, look, look. There's Mike Gonzalez waving to us from outside Swerchak. Be with you in a minute, Mike. Take it easy, fellas. Let me get used to the altitude. He's right. Wow, will you take a look at those huge boulders? For crazy formations. As if some oversized monster had twisted them into those shapes. Fifty, sixty feet high. But they don't look real. Morning, Bob. JJ. You sleep well? Like a top. Yeah, same. The noise of the engines didn't bother you too much, I hope? Well, after the flight over the mainland, which I thought would never end, nothing could have stopped us from sleeping like a couple of kids. Well, let's uh, go into the work shack. Quieter and a little warmer. Ah, 
Want some hot coffee? Oh, no, thanks. No, we just finished breakfast. A little uh, trouble with your breathing, J.J.? Uh, a little. Yeah, the altitude. 10,000 feet above sea level. Uh, just take things easy till your bodies get used to it. Now, let's talk about ice sheet. It's been thickening into a solid mass at the rate of over five feet a year. For how many years? No one knows for sure. We've already taken ice out of the drill hole that's 27,000 years old. 27,000 years old? And we've only drilled down into a little over a mile of ice. What makes everything so much more difficult is that the whole sheet floats in constant motion. What was that? That, my friend, may be our biggest worry. Maybe our only real worry. The, the, the ice cracking up? It might be just that. But, but how? Why? What, what would cause that? What was that noise, Mike? That sound you just heard could well be the result of a nuclear explosion somewhere down here at the bottom of the world. Maybe a thousand miles away. Our instruments will indicate, if I'm right, the second one in ten days. They are very methodical. Then if Dr. Burns was right... A few more blasts like that last one, and we may have to close the book. Final chapter. We drove ourselves in the garden, but it was always possible to return. Up until now. Now it looks as though we may have planted seeds in the dead soil of a lost world. A world that may have to go on, if it goes on, without us. Well, we don't just sit here with our heads in our hands, do we? I mean, can't they be stopped some way? Any suggestions, Bob? The time may have come for all of us to fold our tents. We, as opposed to they, may have to give up this little piece of real estate we call the world. It may only be a matter of days. And meanwhile? Meanwhile... We prepare to get out just as fast as we can. Not only from this place here, but from the entire planet, while we still have the chance. It's been said that a man begins to live only when he treats each new day as if it were his last. Our three friends in the South Polar area of some time in the future have the feeling that every tick of the clock is bringing them closer and closer to their inevitable end. That each of the next few days may indeed be not only their last, but the last for most of the world they know. I'll return shortly with Act Two. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But turn a couple of pages and we read, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Might this be the thought going on in the minds of the three men in the south polar area of the sub-frigid zone at some time in the future as they listen to it? It may be only a matter of days. And meanwhile? Meanwhile, we prepare to get out just as fast as we can. Not only from this place here, but from the entire planet while we still have the chance. And the first thing we do is to make contact with headquarters at SSC, Dr. Bird's. And then I'm almost certain that all hell will break loose up there. Here goes. We've got over a thousand rocket ships on the alert, ready to take off on an hour's notice. Just for the eastern seaboard alone. Did you know that, Mike? Each one capable of taking on a thousand passengers. Total, one million. That's quite a few people. A million? Pretty small number for this particular job. Remember, there are over 10 billion of us all over the globe. Calling ODF. SSC calling ODF. Yes, I've got him. If I can just clear this channel. Burns of the Strategic Sea Command, Operation Deep Freeze. Are you there, ODF? Dr. Burns? 
That, that you, Mike? Yes, Dr. Burns. I was just trying to get through to you. I thought for a minute they might have jammed our wavelength. Am I coming in clear? Very clear. What the devil's going on down there, Mike? Why do you ask, Doctor? We've got some of those strange readings we got last week. The instruments are going crazy. In fact, there have been two sets of readings this morning, only minutes apart. What's up, Mike? I think that what we've been suspecting all along may already be happening. Yes, I'm almost sure of it, Mike. And they're putting just about everything they've got into those explosions. What are your orders? Mike, how long would it take to dismantle every bit of vital equipment? Uh, three days? Maybe four? Depends. Four? Mike, I want you and your crew to destroy every piece of usable equipment you've got. Everything. Right away. Every motor, every machine, every instrument. Except the radio. Leave that for the last. When do we start? Right now. Mike, we're at the point where every hour, every minute may count. You mean that we... The sub-frigid ice sheet has already begun to slip. Broken up in over a dozen places. We'll follow your orders to the letter, sir. Then head back up here as quickly as you can. Load your men into the choppers. Head north for the mother ship which is waiting for you. Now, Mike, we'll radio your assignment to a specific spacecraft on your way up here. Mike, this is it. So shake the ice out of your tails real fast. Every one of you. Mike, I heard that. And the instruments have gone absolutely berserk. What's happened? Mike, what's happened? Answer me. Are you all right, all of you? Answer me. Answer. J.J., come on, wake up, wake up. J.J., you all right? Oh, sorry, I... I must have passed out. That last blast was a real big one. A lot nearer than any of the previous ones. I think I must have passed out myself for a couple of seconds. Well, let's see now. Mike! Huh? Look out the window. Where? Where our crew was drilling. I don't believe it. It's not possible. Every single one of the drill towers has collapsed. Yeah, and everything with them. The shock of that last explosion just toppled them over. Drill towers, drills, drill pipes. The entire works. Like so many children's toys. Well, I've got to get out of here and see that the crew is safe and no one was hurt. Yeah, we'll go with you. Uh, meantime... Meantime, we get everybody into those choppers just as fast as we can and head north for the mothership. And then? And then, J.J., we pray... So far, thank heavens this mothership was waiting for us. Yeah, and here we are, in it. Headed for where? Any idea, Mike? Specifically? No. All I know is that we're safe. If we get on one of the thousand rocket ships that are waiting for all of us, we head out into space in the direction of... In the direction of where? Your guess is as good as mine, J.J. There are a million stars twinkling out there in space. Other planets, other universes, even other galaxies. They go on forever, just swishing their way around infinity. And we'll be speeding towards some tiny star out there that we know in advance can sustain our kind of life. And, you know, that's the whole idea start our civilization all over again. How did they ever get to the point where they could make all this happen? Oh, who knows? Some accidental freak of nature, then developed by a kind of uh, planned breeding into a completely new race. A race that can withstand every extreme of temperature, from 200 below zero to 200 above. And their ability to survive either in the air or underwater. How do we explain that? Who knows? By 
some weird process of selective evolution, they managed to breed themselves into cold-blooded vertebrates who look just like us, but act biologically like amphibians. Like frogs and salamanders. Exactly. With both gills and lungs at the same time. Breathing partly through those thick skins of theirs. Yeah, but nothing can penetrate. Well, almost nothing. I suppose their ability to change their voices at will to sound exactly like us, or as if they were speaking from underwater, has to do with the fact that they are amphibians. Maybe. I wish we knew where we were, how close we are to our destination, wherever it is. If they hadn't blacked out every portal, every window... That's a security measure, J.J. Yes, I know that. Gentlemen, will you please fasten your safety belts? Well, we're about to get some of our questions answered, I think. The captain has asked me to tell you that we are within a few minutes of landing at our predetermined base. After we land, you are asked to remain seated until the aircraft has come to a complete stop. Yes, but stop where? Well, you're about to find out. All occupants will then proceed across the east runway to one of the rocket ships which is awaiting you. He hasn't said which one. Patience, J.J. And when he tells us which one, how do we find it? Proceed across the east runway? We have just received from SSC headquarters the designation of your particular rocket craft. Here he goes. The rocket craft reserved for passengers aboard this ship is Beta Epsilon number 203. I repeat, Beta Epsilon 203. It can be reached by boarding ramp C on your right across the east runway as you exit. Thank you. Yeah, did you get all of that, J.J.? Boarding ramp C on our right across the east runway to rocket craft Beta Epsilon 203. Couldn't be clearer. All right, now fasten your safety belt. Sorry. Brace yourselves for landing. Here it comes. I wonder if Dr. Burns is here to meet us. To get a one-to-one -one report from us on what happened? I certainly hope so. You got all your things, J.J.? Uh-huh. And we're about to come to a stop. I must confess, I'm a little concerned about the next leg of this trip. As well, uh, we're all concerned, J.J. Very much concerned. I can tell you, uh, I'm a little terrified. It's taking them an awfully long time to open those doors. Well, what's holding them up? Oh, patience, J.J., patience. Are they going to keep us standing here all day? Why don't they open the doors? Gentlemen, may I ask all of you to please take your seats once again? The captain informs us that there is some slight difficulty in opening the doors from the outside. Meanwhile, please relax in your seats until the doors are cleared. The delay will be slight. Slight? What can be wrong? Any number of things, Bob. The captain has also asked me to make the following announcement. Please listen carefully. Once the doors are opened from the inside of the craft, please make your way to boarding ramp C in the reception hall which is heated as quickly as you can. Wear the warmest clothes you have with you. What's he talking about, heated, warmest clothes? It's summer up here. Place mufflers or scarves, whatever you may have available, over your mouths and noses. Breathe as little of the air as possible. What's wrong with the oh, air? Both of you, listen. That will be all for the moment. Uh, I uh, think I know what's happened. I'm sure the outside temperature has already dropped so low that just breathing the air for more than a minute or two will freeze the tissues of the lungs into solid lumps of ice. And so the people in cities that are above sea level... Gentlemen, please stand by. We have succeeded in opening one of the crisis doors. Prepare to disembark by sliding down the emergency chute. I can't wait to get out of here. Keep, keep moving, Bob, please. All right, easy, J.J., now easy. This way, gentlemen, please. What is this? What, what oh, happened? That's the most savage wind I've experienced in my entire life. I don't, I don't think we'll be able to buck it. Last reason. Uh, it's crippling. I cannot be grieved. Look. Look, there's no one out there. It's not a living soul. There is, Bob. Look there. And there. 
Those, those, those are the maintenance men. The men who take care of the aircraft. Why are they standing there in those strange positions? I think they're all dead, J.J. Frozen stiff into whatever positions they must have been in. What do we do? Make a run for the reception hall and boarding ramp C and hope we get there. And if we don't, then we join that group of stone-cold statues out there. Those refrigerated corpses we're staring at. I'll get out first. It goes! Our three scientists make a dash toward survival to catch the transportation that will carry them away from a planet that's quickly collapsing about them. This in the hope of colonizing a brave new world in the outermost reaches of space, a place safe from annihilation by a new race of destructive beings who want the world for themselves. I'll return shortly with Act Three. From Chapter Five of the Book of the Revelation. And I saw a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming, Who is worthy to open the book? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. No man today is privileged either to open that book of the future completely or to reveal what lies ahead for all of us. But the scientists are doing their best to peek, trying hard. Now, we rejoin our three scientists. I I don't think I've ever run so fast in my whole life. You, J.J.? Halfway to this hall, I would sure I'd never make it. You're right, Mike. A little... uh... Weak in the knees and very short of breath. But we did make it. What's more, we're, we're on high ground. It's, uh, it's warm and comfortable in here. And uh, we don't have to go outdoors again to get to the rocket ship. I'm not sure I could go through that a second time. Have you uh, two noticed anything peculiar? Anything special about the people who seem to be moving toward Beta Epsilon 203? Peculiar? No, I haven't had the chance to look. Yeah. Well, when you get the chance, look. You may find a little surprise. Meanwhile, I'm going to try to get a call through to Dr. Burns again. Yeah, he's, he's got to know that we've come through safely up to this point. And the shape of the place we left. What's happening, Mike? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. This number doesn't answer. Mike, do you suppose that... I don't know how to say this. That they have penetrated the Strategic Sea Command? That neither Burns nor the SSC exist any longer? Well, there's always that possibility. You got no answer, Mike? No, nothing. Just silence. Dead silence. Well, we'd better move along to Beta Epsilon 203. The ship is full. We've been sitting here over 20 minutes. Why don't they take off? Get us off this ground. Get the whole thing over with. I'm sure they're doing their best, J.J., You all that anxious to leave our little world? This is no round trip, you know. It's one way, all the way. They're welcome to what's left. Good riddance. Well, let's face it. I mean, we don't have much of a choice. We couldn't possibly stay alive here. They can, but we can't. Well, sooner or later... Let's count ourselves among the lucky ones. Lucky to be able to leave. There are millions of other men and women who'll never make it. You're both right, of course. You've 
get you with it. We're finally off. So long, new world. Here's to our new paradise. We walk through blindfold. And the noiseless doors close after us forever. to being among the lucky ones, has uh, either of you had the time or curiosity to take a peek at any of our fellow passengers? I have, and I must say I'm very impressed. Yes, I've noticed too. Some of the leading brains and creative talents from all over the entire world. I've already counted eight Moonstone Prize winners, half a dozen recipients of the Literary Scroll of Honor, the presidents of five different countries. Mm-hmm. As I saw them as they were coming on. You know, this is uh, quite possibly the most distinguished shipload of passengers that ever existed. A thousand of them. About as many men as women. A good half of them young enough to help populate a brand new world. What you might call extremely careful planning. Mm, indeed. Putting the leaders of the world the ablest, the most creative, the best minds and bodies. I've seen a few gold medal athletes, all on the same carrier, all headed for the same place. It's absolutely brilliant. And we are lucky to have been chosen. <laughs> Who do you suppose thought of this? Who is responsible for it, Mike? Mm, I have no idea, Bob. And uh, I hope you're right. Right, about what? About how brilliant an idea this was. You'd, uh, you'd think Dr. Burns would be on board, wouldn't you? Well, maybe he's in one of the other sections of the ship, which would explain why we couldn't reach him. No, yeah, could be. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Beta Epsilon 203. Listen. The captain has asked me to tell you that our planned destination is Galen 2683 of the galaxy of the Lapathy. The physical properties of Galen 2683, its life-supporting qualities, air, water, climate, extremes of temperature, are almost identical with those that we have left behind. That's comforting to know. Quiet, J.J. In the unlikely event that there should be any difficulty in landing for any reason, Maton 2211 of the same galaxy will serve as backup. Flying time should be approximately 48 hours. That's all? If you have any questions, members of the crew will be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Galen 2683. Here we come. Will the following passengers please identify themselves by pressing button B at the right of their seats? Mr. Michael Gonzalez, J.J. Porter, and Robert McDonald. I've got the button right here. I'll get it. There is a voice message for you three gentlemen. Kindly connect by pressing button F, as in Frank. Thank you. As in Frank. There we are. Who could possibly... Mike, Bob, JJ. This is Burns. Dr. Burns. Hmm, what do you know? Are you uh, all right? You take it, Bob. Uh, yes, uh, we're just fine, Dr. Burns. How about you? Fine. Uh, we're certainly happy to hear your voice. We tried to reach you before we left. Uh, we... Had a little difficulty. That's understandable under the circumstances. I suppose you'd like to know how we are. At the moment, I would like to know nothing. Let me talk to him. Dr. Burns, this is J.J. The passenger list on this ship seems to be very special. We thought you might be on it. Obviously, I am not. And, of course, none of you has any idea why. Or have you? What's the matter with him? He sounds funny. Mike Gonzalez here, Dr. Burns. I'd like to venture a guess why you're not here. Yes? Are you free to speak? Just answer yes or no. The answer is yes. Now listen to me, the three of you. You've noticed that your fellow passengers are people most capable of starting a new civilization. They will never have that chance, unfortunately. 
Why not, Dr. Burns? Because none of you will ever make a beachhead on Galen 2683 or any place else. What's he talking about? We all know how efficient they are, do we not? They are nothing less than diabolical in working out their plans. That they do nothing without a precise master plan. So? Beta Epsilon 203 is part of that plan. A plan to exterminate every leader of the world all at once in one single blow. I don't believe this. Believe it. There's not a chance that even a few of you escaping or surviving. The end for all of you will be complete, final, and very neat. But we're headed toward a beachhead on Galen 2683. Isn't there any such place? Yes, there is. But not for you. In a short while, the rocket ship you're traveling on will explode, will disintegrate into space. Not a shred of any of you will survive. That's not possible. It's possible. Because, because that's the way we planned it. We? We. Those that you call they. What is that? It's like burning rubber. No idea. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not to be alarmed by what seems to be the smell of burning rubber. It is routine at this stage, as is the mild turbulence you may be experiencing. Mild? We're being bounced around like... Easy, easy, easy. Uh, look, he's making his way toward us. You gentlemen received your message satisfactorily? Yes, we did. Thank you very much. You uh, understand its significance? I think we do. Then there's no point in pretending any further. One of us is keeping an eye on the crew. I watch the passengers. Not that there's anything you could possibly do to prevent what will happen. A question. Yes? How much time do we have before... Minutes. A very few minutes. And what happens to you and uh, the one up forward that's guarding the crew? We die. We vanish, along with the rest of you. We volunteered for this trip. And the mechanism that will set the whole thing off? Uh, the explosion, uh, the disintegration? Right here, right over your heads. The captain is the only one who would know how to deactivate it. And he's not free at the moment. Now, gentlemen, if you will excuse me... J.J., what are you doing? Put down that gun! I'll get him first, then his friend up there with the crew. J.J., now, it won't do any good. That's not the... Excellent marksmanship, young man. Your rather quaint, old-fashioned bullet struck me right over the heart. How foolish. How wasteful. Surely you know your bullets cannot penetrate our skins? No. But this can. Ah! And now, the same treatment for his friend. A forward in the cockpit with the crew. Mike, J.J., excuse me, please. You sure it's all right, General Dukes? Just make yourselves at home. Not too crowded, all three of us here in the control booth? Oh, plenty of room and a much better view. If it hadn't been for you, Mr. McDonald, and your laser gun, there wouldn't be any view. And your deactivation of their mechanism, General? We're all very lucky. It's all over and in the past, General. It's what's ahead of us that counts. Uh, look out there. Coming right at us. Galen 2683. That little speck? That tiny pinpoint? <laughs> pinpoint or not, J.J., that's going to be our new home. That's a new world for all of us. How long before we're inside its orbit? At our present speed, I make it uh, one hour, 12 minutes, and uh, 28 seconds before landfall. Keep your eye on it. Oh, it gets bigger and bigger even while we watch it. It's like a little blue-green ball. We're traveling fast. There's our future, all right. Uh, our future is in the hands of fate, J.J. Wait a minute. Take another look at Galen 2683, gentlemen. Our future would now seem to be in our own hands. Holy... What, what happened? It, it was there, and, and then it... It just kind of... 
disintegrated. It disappeared right in front of our eyes. There's nothing there. Nothing. Are we, are we looking at some kind of mirage, General? No, sir. It happens all the time. What? One minute there'll be a star no one's ever seen before. Just materializes before our eyes. The next minute, something like this Galen star just blows up in our faces. Destroys itself. And is never seen or heard from again. Did he? But we get used to it. And why do you suppose a thing like that happens? What causes that? Who can tell? Every once in a while, a star and the people on it turns to cosmic dust. Well, what's our next procedure, General Dukes? From this point, we veer to 28 degrees, 34 minutes, 2 seconds to starboard, and hope we can reach Maton 2211. And also hope that it's still there when we get there. i got a question, General. I know these stars sometimes have had other names other than the designations we've given to them. Just out of curiosity, would you know if Galen 2683 was ever called anything else? Well, I have a feeling it was. Hey, let me get the book. You got your reading glasses, Bob? Uh, yes, sir. See if you can find it under G. Uh, let's see now. That's, um, E, F, uh, all right, here we are. Uh, Galen, uh, two, six, eight, three. Yes. It did have another name. Back in the 1970s and 80s, it was known as the Earth. <laughs> J.J., Bob, Mike, and their companions hurtle through space, bound for an obscure star, hidden away in an endless cosmos. We wish them Godspeed. A journey that started in the frozen, sterile wastes of one world will terminate, we trust, on the less barren, welcoming soil of another, where they can build an exciting, fresh new world by profiting from some of the mistakes of this one. I'll return shortly. find it of more than passing interest that within the past two years, the Institute of Polar Studies of Ohio State University suggested the possibility of some of the things you heard in our story. In February 1977 at Edwards Air Force Base in California, a year's tests were begun at the Dryden Flight Research Center as a prelude to an altogether new era in space flight. A few days later, we read that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, is accepting applications at the Johnson Space Center in Houston for what they call mission specialists. Just how special will these missions be? Our cast included Tony Roberts, Christopher Tabori, William Griffiths, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.